started. All right, so um, it is Friday, Friday, October 7th at 9.30 a.m. So we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. We have here with us our four board members um, and then many guests. So I actually really value the opportunity to go around just um, setting our role. I'll just kind of introduce ourselves. Um, I don't know unless that was just later or in. Either way, we're going to do that. that. That's part of our Okay, just a, that was a quick little room all around the table. Would be very cool. Dr. Herman, would you mind if we start reading when you take a bite? <laughs> uh, Flip Herman, Superintendent. Uh, Dave Larson, District 5. Edna Morris, <clears throat> District 4. Dr. Board Chief, Superintendent of Officer. Amy Cast from Monta Leadership Consulting. Jan Melinda, District 2. Michelle Rogers are Chris Thank you. Yeah. Um, and welcome to any guests that may be joining us. So it doesn't look like there are any um, online. Um, all right, so we'll approve uh I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. All right, all in favor. Aye. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'll have our guests, Dr. Uh, Rochelle Rogenzard and uh, Dr. They've been working with uh, Central School Districts last year and this year. And uh, I've worked with several different school districts. Obviously, they'll introduce themselves and what they do. But I can say that this week, uh, both last night and Tuesday night, has been really good work. Um, with a lot of our administrators throughout the district. So lots of good questions, lots of uncomfortableness, um, as is meant to be. And uh, I think very just insightful work um, that's ongoing will always be ongoing. So I just really appreciate the work that you're doing with us. Thank you, Dr. Engen, Dr. Gordon Dave for, for bringing us in collectively. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing uh, the last few weeks, not in the next few years, shortly. Uh, and then we can start to get into some creative work uh, for the next um, and so, so, thank you again. It's nice to um, work with school boards and get to reach across the country, mostly on the West Coast. Uh, school districts, school boards are not having a secret kind of fun, as we all know. And yeah, so uh, we begin with context. Um, does everybody know that? As you know, the picture that's on the right is uh, taken right outside of the school the district. So you can see pictures of schools that are taken from right outside. Almost like we just bought outside of the picture. Like, hey, this is so um, and so schools today look like kind of like that. And yet, you all know the picture on the left, I at some point I would imagine you've seen it. That means there's not a lot of pictures of these publicly available um, on historic. Um, and were you teaching when that building was built? Oh, wow. Wow. So, Almost. So, so I the fiery energy already. <laughs> right? Uh, so, this school uh, was a couple blocks down the street. Uh, and part of the, the context that we began with was you asked two different ways. Number one is that the structure of schools fundamentally has not shifted. Uh, from not just 130 years ago, but actually from 700 years ago. Um, we still use the same kind of infrastructure. We still use a one teacher generally to elect students. We may have increased or decreased the number of students by age group and category, not the same, but fundamentally, the structure of schools in the United States and abroad looks pretty similar to a hundred ish more years ago. Uh, and what and, and obviously that looks a little bit different part two is who this school is built for also looks fundamentally different than what currently exists. So, so 90% of the student population in general in schools are in our of color. But you can imagine the class practice school back then was not. In fact, uh, it was illegal to enroll uh, to go to school without uh, but also uh, many uh, very few schools uh, on the West Coast enroll women girls uh, as well. So so who this school was structured for, designed for, uh, was was white workers mostly. Um, and so to think about the infrastructure of schools, 
kind of just keep on using the integration, but we still use the exact same infrastructures, even though the uh, country is district. This is not this is not a high school thing, this is not a high school thing, this is a collective school context. Our school infrastructure is not about to be created uh, for educating within a positive framework students and others. So we just begin with the reality of where we are um, and thinking about schools as a larger, very complicated, circular path that's really even possible with the schools that are just going to be the opposite. So we're, we're going to go back around this time um, a, a little bit uh, more creatively. Share what you do with not your job title in three words or less. The meaning of your first name, where it appears, and then one word to describe how you experience racism. One word to describe how you experience racism. So when somebody's ready to go, pop popcorn, and then we'll get in the same direction. The obvious of it. If you can write that on, you can write over this is a little more complicated. <laughs> no worries, no pressure. Might get a little pressure. <laughs> I think that was some sweet. <laughs> had a little experience. Had a <laughs> yeah. uh, I would say three words uh, collaborate, dialogue, learn. Meaning of my first name, Flip. Um, I explained previously, my father was a drill sergeant in the army in Vietnam, and they used to call me recruits Junior Flips. So I'm actually named after him, Lester Junior. Lester's my good name. But because I was the son, I was the new recruit. So I was like, my that side of the name has all sorts of little nicknames Cricket, June Bug, Kitchen, <laughs> all these kind of names. So mine was Flip. Oh, yeah. um, we have more <laughs> one word to describe my experience, uh, how I experienced racism, at least say what I used before, which is understand. Thank you. She's a direction. Let's go this way. So, um, three words, well, two words. Um, what you do support students, you know, two words. Um, meaning of my first name. So, my parents actually gave me the name Dave, not David. I don't know lots of people try to change it to David. David, I think the meaning of that word is originally beloved. And share one word to describe how you experience racism um, gaps. Thank you. Thank you. What was your word? Gaps. Oh, you, yes. I'm Edna, and I, <clears throat> I try to be reflective and supportive and be a voice uh, for the staffing community. <clears throat> Um, I don't know what my name is. It just came from my grandma. <laughs> and um, from afar. Good morning. Um, three words demanding high expectations. The meaning of my first name is Millicent, and that means strength. And a word to describe racism is frequently. And um, three words of lesson what I do, I um, what I strive to do is communicate and make change. The meaning of my first name is friend. And um, one word to describe how I experience, right, again, aspirational, how I experience racism is counteract. Uh, my three words would be clothes, shelter, and feed. Um, the meaning of my name is that uh, my sister got to name me because I was a girl. My brother would have named me a boy. So I. And one word to describe experiencing racism. Um, uh, keep on say something like one. So my words would say advocate, care, and lead. Um, my 
I don't actually know the meaning of my first name. There's a lot of debate about who else knew that. Mm -hmm. um, my grandma says it's her, everyone else says it's not true, but I'm going to go with that one. Um, <laughs> one word that describes how I experience racism is a lot. I just uh, layered. Thank you. So I'm Michelle, and uh, my first name, well, okay, let me go to, let me follow directions. So <laughs> I do is I interrupt. And um, the meaning of my first name is Little Lamb. Oh. So you can just tell that just is all around me. And then I experience racism intersection. Mm -hmm. uh, I grow fiery demons. Keeping with today's theme of fire and heat, you start. And I was in the middle of the film. I was supposed to ask a change to my grandmother to provide the constitution to the constitution. And one word to describe how I experience racism in the age. Thank you all. There's going to be a whole way to the square, square brackets, uh, including somebody else that heard skipping over somebody else. What did you learn about? Um, I'm assuming all of you know each other, right? What did you, anything that you learned with that little exercise? I learned about cricket. Mm -hmm. oh my God. That's not my name. That's my <laughs> cousin's. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Those other names are. Other oh, they weren't. Yeah. All right. We won't call you. Anything else? Mm -hmm. About Dave's name being Dave, not David. It's interesting because often people spend a lot of time around each other, and especially in education spaces, and we don't really take the time to even at a like a just you know a little dip below the surface, right? Mm -hmm. um, the work is important, but it's imperative that we create some sort of understanding of who we are in the room, because when we have uncomfortable conversations, the the bonds that we've developed help move some of that work, right? But if we don't take the time to do that. We remain at service. And so we're excited that we will be working with you over the year to help you both build some musculature around how we have really uncomfortable conversations, but also to get underneath some of those pieces. Because how else do we know how to work together if we don't know what we're working with, right? So um, just a little meta and you know, like doing the things, figuring out why it is that we do them and then processing that. Because we're teachers, so all right, that's what we do. Thank you for that. Um, um, I think that's you. You want me? Okay. Yeah. So we acknowledge always that we live and work on unceded ancestral land, right? The numeral, numeral coastal Salish nations, um, and the the continued and ongoing displacement, right, of indigenous peoples allows us to pay respect, but understanding what needs to be continually displaced, right? And how that um, affects people. And then also the burden of environmental exploitation and systemic injustice that falls squarely upon black and brown people in the building of this country and these institutions is another way that we look at displacement, right? That black and brown people were born and died working this land against their will for generations in this country, right? So. We acknowledge the continued labor of survivors of that, right? Over the centuries to today, of immigrant labor, uh, including voluntary and involuntary traffic, course, and undocumented people in building what we call the United States. It is necessary that we understand that where we sit right now is a result of many, many, many people's labor that was forced or trafficked or undocumented, right? And involuntary and the removal of generations of people. So just sit in the awareness and the knowledge that um, we, are, we are so unbelievably fortunate to have the opportunity to choose to be here. So we begin with context, right? thinking about who's excluded from the structure of the spaces that we're in, who the spaces that we're in were designed for, right? And then literally, quite literally, who's actually who we are within this work, right? And then a continued recognition of the, right, the exploitative structures that are much larger than the district, right? That are societal, 
within this content strategies. Uh, and so for the past, so last year, last year, um, the two of us, the and I, um, were, were brought in uh, through largely, um, or we, we conquered with a large project that we were doing with uh, UC County uh, through um, Dr. Anthony Brown and Brian Brown. I'm assuming you have all met both of these two, but that's an assumption that is clearly wrong. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, so, I'll, so I won't speak to their work necessarily, but a lot of, a lot of what they do is support the racial equity work across UC County districts. Um, so, so both of them in multiple roles um, work around school improvement, um, leadership development, frameworks for support for districts to elevate their equity, racial justice, needs, and, and strategies for them. And I think Aaron was working with you last year in conjunction with Amy, correct? Oh, I was just yeah. like, Aaron was working in conjunction with you, Amy, right? And Aaron from yes, yes, I mean, I mean, I mean. I right. Thank you. That's why you guys are looking at me. It was me. I was really close. Right. Okay, it was me. And, and, but anyway, so I knew it was working. I knew it was part of the team, just so we provide context for um, PG Sound. And you know that, that they're part of, they're like your kind of Okay, so that's what I was trying to figure out. How oh, Amy fit into that. Yes, you can see in there a consultant with WASA. Oh, with WASA, right? So, so parallel work and okay. just, you know, teaming up to, to offer support. So, okay. you know, remember, you know, all the beauty of the multiple layers in this <laughs> of uh, right? It, in many other states, it's county office of education, your ADSD, right? And then state level mm -hmm. as well, right? In theory, you think we have some kind of like network. Part of the work to be done. I do that. Uh, right. So, the last year we So, the technological district aspect of the work uh, was based on five schools. Um, and so, we worked with the principals. We had ongoing negotiations um, with the site team, so, principals and equity leads uh, from each of those schools, um, as well as a team from the office leadership. Um, and then, so in addition to uh, kind of similar professional development that we're doing uh, this year, uh, we, we did them district wide essentially, so a little bit less focus, a little bit more on site, uh, a little less focus, a little less district wide and more specific to the site. Right. Um, site, to site yeah. right? Um, and then, intensive focus, uh, helping folks wrestle with how do I do the work, how do I interrupt some of these. Systemic pieces, how do I interrupt microaggressions? How, how do we create a climate within our specific system? Really, what is, what is my role as a principal, as a leader, as an equity leader? Um, and then how do I strengthen my school skill sets to essentially interrupt and build systems um, that challenge institutionalized racism? In Especially in the context of the pandemic, right? So last year was almost all. I all think the whole thing was virtual, and I don't know if you uh, remember, but in the middle of the year, there was like this huge surge, mm -hmm. and so we were really trying to help support principals as they were trying to move this work forward, still dealing with the pandemic, which students were just coming back, you know, taking back to the time when we did decide to bring students back, and then there were all these behavioral issues, students hadn't been used to being in classrooms, right, all those things were happening. And so it was a really interesting time that the principals needed some support on a variety of things because it was not school as normal. Right. Can you, can you tell how many times did you meet with the schools? Was that monthly? The principals we met every other month. So the way that it was structured, there would be PD one month, principal coaching the next month, PD coaching. And what was the turnout for the PD? So it was all the teams. So oh, the teams, not the whole staff. I'm no, sorry. no, I'm okay. sorry. So the structure was we identified these schools and the principals identified their team. So for example, at Showalter, I have the principal, the equity lead, and two other people that he identified, right? And so those four would come to the PD, which we started at the beginning in August. And then the next month was coaching with that same team. And so that's all. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So monthly, but intensive coaching every other month. Right. That's all, Andy. I have to say something. Yeah, you got it.
So here's what we're going to do this year. So um, we are meeting, as Flip said, with the um, an intense uh, focus on how do we do this work now, having done site base last year. How do we do this work building our leadership team that is both site based and central office, right? And so the decision was made that we would meet four times over the year with a core group of our core principals and our core central office leaders. We began that this week. I've got to say, I thought it was great. We've got a great team of leaders here at Tukwila. So October 4th and 6th, um, the content, racial equity, purpose of schools, because we use, and which we'll talk about in a moment, we use a 5D framework that we'll share with you this is really about defining, right? And so you'll notice that we're here with the board today. And then in November, November 30th, December 1st, we'll be the same team again, virtually, where we're gonna talk about more defining, but also what does it mean to disrupt, right? Anti-Blackness, whiteness, caste, and really getting clear about critical race theory because a lot of us talk about it, but we don't know what it is. <laughs> then uh, March 1st and 2nd, um, looking at street data, we're going to talk about the books that we're using that we're going to be asking you as board also to be familiar with, right? And um, that gets us from, from defining to really looking at disrupting a little bit more. Also, it's my understanding we'll be meeting with you in March. And then finally in May, um, again, what does it mean to take all of this learning and really create some plans to put it in action? Um, and then that's what we call dreaming and designing what's possible. So this is our scope for the year, provided some resources to you. Um, and so we wanted to just bring that. So year two, going deeper. Year one, really about trying to support um, principals in a really, really rough year. Year two, how do we bring the principals and the central office leadership together so that we, they can all be on one accord? I like to say Takula is small and nimble enough to be able to do some things differently. I can't imagine trying to bring all the site leaders and district office leaders like Seattle Public Schools, right? That would be huge. But at Tech Willa, you have the opportunity to really create a robust team of individuals who can lead the work with the board support undergirding what these uh, what the leadership is doing. So excited about that for the scope and sequence. Um, so as I said, here is our framework. And you know, this is a conversation. So feel free to just stop me anytime. Stop us and just ask whatever you want to ask. Um, here's our framework. We call this the five Ds that we believe in order to address um, intersectional racism, we must first define what the core concepts are that we're talking about. Sometimes we um, use terms and we're not, we don't have a shared definition of what those terms are. And what I term equity and someone else terms equity is very different and we wonder why we can't move forward. So let's define those four terms and then strengthen our skills to disrupt terms and to disrupt not just these terms, but also the actions and the policies and the beliefs and behaviors. And I think of disrupting, and I always say this, I think of disrupting as dominoes are falling and you put your hand in the middle of the fall. These dominoes have fallen, but these are still standing on the side, right? So putting your hand there is actively disrupting and what I believe we can do as leaders in our school district is figure out where we have the agency to actively disrupt, right? Then if you then you know what you're talking about, you have disruptors, and then you decide to dismantle, that's where the disruptors literally link arms, right? So if everyone around the table were to link arms and say, here's how we're going to dismantle this in this district, that's where you have the opportunity to dismantle those white supremacist police behaviors. But it requires, right? It requires literally the disruptors working together. It cannot happen with one person. So it's not up to flip to be like, now we're going to dismantle. It's really about all of us working together to make that happen. But not just so that we can tear down things, but rather so that we can create an opportunity to dream and design what can be possible. And when I think of that, I think of the students and wanting to hear from our students and wanting to hear from our community members and wanting to make sure that we're listening really well to what could be possible 
and Tequila. So that's our framework that we use. Feel free to, you know, if you have any questions, otherwise we'll just keep going. We're teachers. <laughs> All right, so today we're gonna to get into some concepts. Um, we're gonna share some um, uh, essential questions to help guide our work and our recommended vision for this work. And then with that, we're going to be building some accountable space and then just continue to create the community. I realized I don't have to like, this is a good community. Yeah, okay. So um, our roles will be to facilitate and to be your timekeeper and then, um, yeah, we're about not on that time, but yeah, that's what we're going to do today. We're going until 11. Here's some community agreements. I'm going to ask that you look at them and choose one that you're going to sort of hold close to you for the remainder of this hour. It's hard to hold one when they're all so you can hold them all. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. And we want to hold them all, but also just maybe one that you're going to kind of focus on. And when you're ready, feel free to just pop one out, which you're going to sort of keep right there in the center and focus. I will say the confidentiality, because this is uh, a <laughs> public meeting, really, really doesn't exist in the public <laughs> right now. And so, um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, even if we take out the confidentiality, we respect them and focus, I think, nice. with or without the confidentiality. I think the confidentiality comes in the individual conversation. Absolutely. Sorry. And I, I, I was tuning in on that one also, and I was using the confidentiality as you know, how much is still taken in that period. Right. So, yeah, uh, I love it. Yeah. Thank you. And I went with the honor of each other and the individual time. Thank you. So, for me, this is a little bit of time. Sorry about the learning space. So, we're getting open to new ideas. Love it. Thank you. I think we are accountable to our group and to ourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to, you know, um, being accountable to the group and ourselves, you know, especially myself here and Ms. Informal. I'm here to be accountable to the group for sure. Thank you. For me, it will be accountable um, to the group and myself. Thank you. Okay. Now that we have those agreements, we've been talking to you for 30 minutes. You're like, who are those people? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Whenever we do presentations, we don't spend a lot of time on this. I know people like to figure out what people are by looking at each other, looking at us up. So feel free to Google us. Um, yeah. Right, my website is rashadrogensorak.com and our website is criticalraceleadership.com. But I think what's really important that you should know about Chris is that um, uh, one of the things I really love and respect about Chris is that he walks. So walk he, that he talks, right? That he's all about his integrity, that what he says he means, and that he consistently does the work. And so when I am working with Chris, I am always really grounded in his authenticity and who he is and what he brings to the work. And I think that's really, really important. He's unbelievably well-read and has published a million things. But um, all of that um, is tangential to the fact that he really is um, who he appears to be. And I think that's really important. Uh, and, and what I, I elevated about the show, uh, two things. Number one, is that I think I'll um, she, she can pull together a million different complicated ideas that help us focus on one that is actually being the point. Uh, especially when we're like, okay, this is wrong, this is wrong, we need to fix this, we have to respond to this, we have to do this. Um, and do so in about five minutes uh, mm -hmm. in, in a way that honors time, um, but also help us read, feel like comfortable and confident um, with some of the work. It's actually really helpful for us to say that. Um, and the second part is that um, she can move her audience with her voice. <laughs> if you haven't already right? got some, some inkling 
um, of, of the way that she consumed that product. Um, she got the way that and the way and family that was practiced. But what she she modeled in the way in which she moves as a singer, as an artist, um, as a performer, I don't know, you know. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. right. um, is that a seamless parallel to how she moves as a person? Super, super sexy, anti masculine and content, um, moving always with the mindfulness of challenging while modeling um, in, in a way that I feel like we can all use the world in the world. Right. How do I, I don't move? How do I challenge while operating those challenges? That's always really difficult for me just sitting there while that happens. So <laughs> it's really, really hard. It's really hard. That's who we are. But what's more important is how we move together, right? So over 55 years of experience in schools, districts, and higher educational settings, both of us together, we are critical race theorists all the way, 100%, with the four tenets of critical race theory, which we will not cover in depth today but definitely will be a huge part of our learning together with you and the board, right? Um, tenant one, racism everywhere all the time. The purpose of schools is absolutely to silence blackness, the cultivation of um, counter narratives of the people of the global majority, um, voice and story, uh, storytelling, and the system moves to self-correct with interest convergence. And if all of that sounds sort of new, just put a pin in it, we're going to definitely hit that um, with you in when we come back in March because it's so huge. But what you should know is that there's so much conversation now in the narrative, right, about critical race theory. It's important that those of us who are supporting educational districts know what it is and what it isn't. And, um, you know, if we take all of our learning from TikTok and Twitter, we will not really know what it is, right? So we want to make sure that we get that to you. The other thing about um, both of us working together is that we model what could be possible across multiple differences, right? So in case you haven't noticed, Fritz and I work a little different. Um, so we model inclusivity, we model diversity, equitable collaboration across numerous differences. And still, we feel like we're able to help work to interrupt what it means to interrupt racism, right? Towards anti-racism. So I feel like um, as you get to know us more, uh, one of the things that is really, really special is the fact that across numerous differences, we still keep that goal of our work ahead of us and can do that well. So that's what I appreciate about us. Um, when we create a race space, a lot of times when we have conversations around race, people say they want to create a safe space. Um, but safety um, sometimes happens through silence and privilege, right? And so what we want to do is we want to create space that is brave. We want to be able to have uncomfortable conversations where we can um, explore issues of bias and injustice and oppression. And the only way to do that is if we're willing to take risks. If we're willing to say, I don't like, I don't feel uncomfortable, I might... Um, I might feel like I don't know, or I might say something that's weird or right. And so we, you know, we have all this anxiety within us on being made to look like maybe we don't know something or we um, might say something that's harmful. What we want to do is respectfully, that's why we started with our community agreements, take risks to say and ask questions understanding that if things do land in a way that feels weird, that we also will be able to apologize and understand what's happening in this learning space. So I'm going to ask all of us to give ourselves a moment to just repeat to yourself, I'm going to be brave in this moment. Just take a breath. I'm going to be brave in this moment. Because if it was easy to talk about race, we wouldn't have to talk about it. Here's a vision that we're offering. <clears throat> we are offering this vision because it's important to know where you're going when you're doing anti-racism work. I use this example all the time. I'm from California and I live in Oakland. To get to LA from Oakland is about six hours. I need to know 
where I'm going when I put that in the GPS, right? I can't just get on by getting my car to start driving. Even though right now I'm probably, I've been elevating that. But still, if I'm using a GPS, I need to be able to put something in. I don't know where I'm going, and the GPS can't guide me unless I have a destination. So it is with this work. We cannot just say, oh, we're going to do some work unless we have the North Star. And the North Star is going to be really north because it takes a lot of time to go on this journey. But we need to be able to create something that folks can get around. Um, and because we understand that without vision, people perish, we want to be able to get to and be able to have something that we can look at and go, this is where we're going. Here's what we're offering. Four items. Number one, the notion of we are an educational organization and we have to understand as an educational organization, we go back to that first uh, house that we saw on the first slide. All educational organizations are complicit in upholding racist systems and white supremacy. It is imperative that we let our stakeholders know that we understand that. We are not shying away from it. Um, we are not um, hiding it. We are not under the covers, right? That all systems structurally in the United States are uphold white supremacy and, um, and racist systems. And so we just name that for ourselves and for our stakeholders, which allows us to then, you know, then we're transparent, right? So we start with, we understand that this is what has happened in our country. Not saying, I am, right, I am, I am this racist person, right, which a lot of people take that as, are you saying I'm racist? That's not what we're saying. We're saying structurally, right, as we understand racism, structurally, all institutions uphold white supremacy, right? So we name that. First step. Second step, what are we going to do about it? Well, we want to commit to taking some, uh, we want to commit to anti-racism and racial equity so that we can dismantle. And this is where we have to decide as a board, are we ready to commit? Are we committing to saying, yes, this is the direction for Tequila School District? Because we have to commit to it. Because it, it would be too difficult if we don't commit for people to push us off of our, of our trajectory. So first we're like, I understand this is a problem. Now I commit to doing something about it. And then thirdly, what are we gonna do? We're gonna take some action. So we're going to, as an anti-racist educational organization, we're gonna support our educators who are transforming their educational spaces because ultimately it's really about our students, right? In the classroom. So we're offering that we understand, we're offering that we need to commit, we're offering to take action, but why? Because ultimately we, our tech woman. And I worked in districts for over oh, like way too many years. And what would always be funny is when teachers would go, the school district is doing this to me. Mm -hmm. Right? Or principals would be like, I don't know what they're doing down there in that school district. And I was like, no, we are the school district. You work here. Right? And so the, the importance of understanding that we are all part of the school district and not there's that board over there doing that step that that, that board is, is part of this right those principles over there we are all part of that and so what i'm offering what we're offering today is a different way of thinking about this one so in the interest of time i don't know uh, oh right yes this is about level one i'm on point okay great so we're going to put the vision back up, but what we want to do is to ask you to do a quick reflection and then maybe like two groups to turn and talk, right? Do we have the fortitude? Do we have the strength? Do we have the metal to center race in our work? Or should we continue doing work as usual? So that's one question. The second question is, do we really want to decenter whiteness and shift power to work towards inclusion and belonging? Which is what I always hear folks say, we want to be inclusive, we want to, we want to create belonging. But the question is, in order to do that, we would need to shift some things. And that can be really, really scary. 
what questions have I raised for you before I ask you to turn and talk and do some processing? I think it would be even scary not to do that. The question Do we have the opportunity? Who's the we referring to there? All of us. The entire district. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Understanding your role is going to be the next question. We're going to come to that. But do we as a district have a fortitude against whomever, right? Folks who might be like, why are we doing this? Don't, right? Do we have a fortitude to stand together? Um, because oh, that's the only way that it can work is if we can stand together. Other questions are meant to raised for you. And if the answer is no, to that question, then it becomes how do we get the Because the first question or second question? The first question. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so if the answer is no, we don't have the fortitude, the question becomes do we, how do we build the fortitude? Mm -hmm. Or the question could also, or the next question could be what else do we do? Like if we're not going to do anti racism, but there's something else that we think is a better option. So it just raises my question. And these are the wonderful conversations. So I think, Amy, do you feel comfortable being in conversation with board members? Are you okay? Okay, cool, cool, cool. So yeah. I'm thinking maybe a three and four for folks. And then let's do, um, is that correct? Let's do seven minutes. Let's do seven minutes of, um, of small group conversation. So yeah, it's turning it up however you want to Yeah, you guys are Yeah, you're a dog. I'm going to I don't know what's going to happen with the owl. That would be really and I think so. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's another question. I didn't kind of considering that for years. It's you know, from well, not so it's not in the So, you know, so you it's that as well as you know, that 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 you know, yeah, that could be a good one. Yeah. With, um, I think, I think it kind of goes back to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, still, the only thing that we were going to do was when I was having a parent to my to know that it was a high school. We can send this. Something like that. Yeah, I think it's it's very important. Well, yeah, I think it's it's very important. Well, yeah, I think it's very important. Well, yeah, I think it's very important. I think that's the thing. Um, that's why I want to take the video on that. What questions about what yeah, there's some people in the class, especially if you're here. I think we are an individual.
Okay, one minute, we'll have a bring back to the Not to say that it's, I still didn't like have so many people like I thought. I, I really had to struggle with like going to answer these questions because it just seemed automatically what my grades were like, like in either or, you know, isn't in my part of working that well. So, <laughs> I heard real nice conversation. <laughs> 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 One of the things that I did to share about is that I think it feels like there are a lot of um, a lot of really great people throughout our district that really have these desires, right? And where individually there may be four or two those kind of individual instructors. There's not the collectiveness that I think that we really need to have have the strength and fortitude to really mm -hmm. manage the work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's similar to the second question on the like I think there are a lot of folks who maybe say they do and don't really know how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, maybe say they don't know how to do that or don't want to add that. Because you're right, different, but there are a lot of folks I think that really have that desire. But again, it's like people are missing that collective piece of how we do that work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. We were talking about the um, coalition of the willing. So there's a lot of things in change where you need to start with the people that get it and understand how to do it, and then implement it there and then spread it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a technology background, so that's we talk a lot about that in technology. You know, how do you include the new technology? You find the people that get it and can do it well, and then they implement it and then. The students are talking about how cool it is and they go over to the other class and why can't we have this and so that you know that's a way of kind of viral spreading of it if you will. absolutely <clears throat> and i think a question you really had is <clears throat> what does decentering my yeah. and shift of power mean yeah that's right. that's right. absolutely yeah, these are deliberately provocative questions, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're absolutely trying to think of questions that will make us push 
right? And make us really think what does it look like? And what does it look like in practice? And what does it look like? What does it look like to be center whiteness? And how hard is it? All those people, all those, you know, the notion of how people will look at that differently. Um, the notion of do we have fortitude as a group? Do we have a small coalition of the willing? How do we know if they're willing? What does that look like? How do we think? All of those things are really, really important. And I would suggest humbly that that's the conversation that we're asking you to have as a board. Like, okay, we have we have decided that we are going to commit to doing to being right. We decided maybe we're committing to doing anti-racism because it's not something that we become, but rather, right? It's a it's a way that we look at um, the work. Uh, well, what happens next, <laughs> right? But how do we start that? What are the actions that we may need to take? And this is step one, really, frankly, is it the work that we want to commit ourselves to over the next three to four years, five years, however, I don't know how long we're going to go but is this the work that we really want to do? And if so, do we start with the coalition of the women? And if so, what does that mean? And, and all those other things. So we chose uh, questions that hopefully you'll be talking about. We don't see you again for a couple of months, five maybe, <laughs> and so uh, or four months. And so this is the okay. So these are the conversations that we're going to be asking you to engage. So um, we're not asking you to come up with answers to that. We want you to start having a conversation so that by May we can at least feel like we're coming a little bit closer to making some action steps. So we as a board, you know, very well. So what guidance would you have and how do we engage about a conversation around decentered and whiteness when we are all centered in whiteness? That's a brilliant question. Anna, you are the right people to have the question, to have the answers. So um, without getting too much into my teacher voice, right? Um, folks of color um, can provide some insight into what it means to be centered, but as white folks, you guys are the ones to do the work. And actually, I want white folks talking about how to be centered whiteness, for sure. I want white folks talking about white supremacy. I don't like I want white folks to be like, wow, we understand and we we understand that this is harmful and we want to talk about what it means to work on our own selves, to do that mirror work and then to do the work collectively. And then we can be co-conspirators with folks of color. But if folks who are white are not willing to do the work themselves, we can't have that. You know that relationship. So actually, you are well poised, but Phen phenomenally well poised. Um, the other thing is sometimes I think we wait for folks of color to push it, but really to show yourselves as, as co-conspirators, as advocates of the work, as um, as white leaders, nothing could be better, right? Understanding that this doesn't mean tomorrow you come in and you're like, well, I've done it all. I am now in places. <laughs> I no longer center whiteness and I'm done. It is a lifetime journey. But imagine how powerful it could be as a board to do the opposite of what another board in a, in a general, this general area did. Right? So I'm not going to mention anything, but I'm just going to say <laughs> there is another board that, when approached with this work, was like, no, 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 no we're not going to do so imagine how amazing it would be for this board, who is a white board, to be like, yeah, we do want to do it. We need to figure it out. That's what you want. It's my perfectionism. I need to get out of my own. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> this, like, I just, I want to do it. I want to do it well, right? And, you know, I can. And tomorrow. We want to do it well and tomorrow. Yes. I was going to say, welcome. Welcome. I see you. Yeah. I mean, what are the things about? My first first series of stuff here mm -hmm. is because fundamentally, what so the, the third kind of we raise is part of the solution is this is a perfect tool to find black, find people of color. Part of the solution to that is centering the voices of people of color. That doesn't have to be a person of color, it's centering the voices. Mm -hmm. Right? 
So that decentering at some point, right? The, 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 the decentering has to happen globally and locally from my pushing. But the centering isn't necessarily something that, right? Like, White folks don't have to be the ones saying, I'm going to speak now. It's like not a 90 thing, white history, right? But we can censor it collectively, community voices, right? There's not procedures in place to normalize that, right? So we have to create some infrastructure for that. Yeah, the other three words that I probably or could have, would have had a thought is, um, Stop doing harm. Yeah. To me, that's yeah. and, and like Carla, I'm not sure how to do that fast. So, but yeah, she said uh, centering your voices is perfect. I love the loneliness, right? I just need everyone to so far to be fun, <laughs> right? Um, do we have a chemistry in that photo? No. Yes, great. So let's read this quote. Can someone could just read it from Beauty and anti racism that you don't have to pretend to be free of racism to be an anti racist. Anti racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it, including in yourself. And it's the only quote. I love this quote and I use it everywhere because I think when we talk about anti racism, the notion is okay, so give me the five things I need to do so I can be anti racist tomorrow. And I'm going to do those really well. I'm going to keep them in my pocket as a cheat sheet. I'm going to have them on like my wrist and I'll be like walking around. Don't you see my anti racism? I am anti racist and a teacher, right? And so that's not what the journey is, right? And it's not necessary that you start tomorrow going, Hello, I'm Rochelle, I'm an anti racist. That's not what the journey is. We don't have to pretend to be free of racism because it is in the air we breathe. It is, if you live in this country, right, it is a part of the work that we're doing everywhere we go. So if we wait until we're free of it to start trying to work on it, then it's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. But we make a commitment to fight it. We do some mirror work. So wherever we find it in ourselves, and we make a commitment to go, you know what? This is the one thing that we're going to work on for the next year in Tequila. We're going to work on overrepresentation of students in special ed. I don't know. I'm just, you know, like, and then we decide that's the one thing that we're going to work on, right? So we're able to understand that our disrupting and our dismantling is a full on process. The other thing I need us to understand is that as a woman of color, I am consistently working on my own fight of anti-racism. So sometimes I think there's a notion that folks have kind of got it and their white folks are trying to catch up. We are all working on this, trying to figure it out. We all have our own things. And so it is a continual journey. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go back to the what pops up for me in that image, though, is that this is important. Mm -hmm. so, and, and you're right, we've got to get this coalition, this collaboration, to be able to move this break. Um, because it's not just a little domino. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are big boulders, huh? Yeah, yeah little dominoes. Yeah, yeah. having to follow them. Yeah. 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 I love that. Well, let's jump into, so here's the thing. We have to be uncomfortable with the fact that we have answered the questions. I know that doesn't work for a lot of people. are like, well, what's the answer? I have to write a question. And then they're like, do we or don't we? <laughs> do we or don't we? Yeah. We're going to let those linger. Oh, All right. So here's our thing about equity, because um, uh, a lot of times what we get is, well, this anti-racism seems hard, let's just do equity. And so the issue about equity, and there's two types, right? Um, as we do work around the country, people are like, can you come in and do educational equity with us? And, you know, my answer is always no, right? And so this notion of educational equity, and having said that, I do need to just say, if there's an organization doing educational equity, I'm not going to say, no, don't do educational equity. It's just not the work that Chris and I do. 
Um, so like it's based upon inclusion, but it's inclusion into st school structures that are already inherently racist. And so for me, I want to I want to make sure we have fairness so we can all be included, but included into what is always the question for me. So that's education. Racial equity is a little bit deeper as well. So it's like, well, we're going to look at these racial disparities. Again, if there's an organization saying we're going to focus on racial equity, beautiful. It's just not the work that Chris and I are doing, right? So I just want to make that really clear. I do not, especially since we're being recorded, I do not want to say that when we work on educational equity or racial equity, those are bad things. What I'm saying is they're insufficient for the work that we do. But any organization that's like, I'm going to knock out this racial equity, beautiful, okay? But it's, it's insufficient for racial justice. And so what we do is we look at this notion of um, the problem with neutrality in this work, right? Where I'm not racist, so I can just do this equity, right? And do things as normal. And so the notion of being not racist, right, is, is really a passive response to like trauma, right? But I'm not racist. I'm a good, I'm, I'm one of the good ones. I'm a, I'm a good person, right? I, I voted for Obama, so I'm a good person, right? When you when you play not racist, you're literally ignoring harm, right? And um, and it's also ignoring that racism happens on purpose, as opposed to that's just something that just came up, right? That's really an interesting. Um, so the history of it, we have a, a race and equity policy of best years ago. Mm -hmm. It started out as the equity policy. And we actually gave it to our students to look at. And the students came back and said, no, you need to put race and equity in the mm -hmm. policy. And so we actually changed. We now have a race and equity policy as, as a result of the students. So anyway, that distinction is. Yeah, yeah it's, I think it's totally good. Good. I thought, yeah. So I appreciate you bringing that up because the notion is that when we or when we run into people, there's going to be people in the community who are like, but I'm not a citizen, so why are you even talking about this, right? And that signifies neutrality. And Kendi says there is no neutrality in racism struggle. There is no neutrality. You are either actively fighting against racism or you're allowing racism to continue. So the notion of I'm not racist signifies neutrality. And I want to just put that there because I believe that the conversations that you may have, this might come up. And I want you to be able to have a response. So I'm not racist signifies neutral neutrality. And we understand that in this particular case, it is an either or. And so in this particular case is you are either working to actively disrupt this mantle, right? Um, racism and racist policies and racist behaviors, or you are literally allowing racism to continue. And that is the that's the piece of anti-racism for us, right? And so we already did that. So if someone could read what anti-racism is. Anti-racism <clears throat> is the active, ongoing process of dismantling and rebuilding new systems. Anti-racist practices actively name whiteness, white supremacy, and white supremacy culture while working to dismantle those systems. Anti-racism, sorry, anti-racism uh, are approaches, not endpoints that invite additional collaborative opportunities continually transform systems. It took us an hour, but this is the crux of the work that we're asking you to do. Right? So we looked at what equity is and isn't. We looked at the notion of neutrality. The reality is you don't have to start. That's why, right? We, we don't have to wait until we're not racist to start working against racism. It's an active, ongoing process. You don't get to a point where you're like, aha, I've now become anti-racist. It doesn't you. I'm now I can wear the t-shirt. It's an active, ongoing process. That's hard for people. It's hard for educators. We are right, we are trained that we do something, we teach it, we grade you, and then that's over. Yeah. And it's done. 
This is not that. It's an active, ongoing process. First, we have to be okay, and then we have to somehow, as a, as a district, be able to communicate that to people. Are like, well, when is this going to be a book? Right? So it's an active, ongoing process of this dismantling and, and recreating new systems, and it's a practice. I absolutely love this. It's a practice. It's a daily practice. Right? We practice law, we practice medicine, we also practice anti racism. It is a practice in naming whiteness, white supremacy, white supremacy culture, whilst we work to dismantle. It is both and. We don't wait till it's dismantled, it's, right? It's, it's, it's really nuanced, right? And it's approaches, right? that invite, and this is the piece, collaborative opportunities. This is not work that can happen by oneself. Interesting. It shouldn't be foreign to learning because lifelong learning. Exactly. But people aren't always lifelong yeah. learners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dating myself, but I remember the 80s when I was teaching, like, we're gonna create lifelong learners. And that was the thing. We're going to create lifelong learners. And I was like, well, I think we can model it. I'm not sure we can create it. But, but that's becoming more and more important as the world moves faster and faster. Absolutely. And, you know, we need to develop more and more life. Absolutely. I had to learn TikTok recently. <laughs> it was a thing. Is that what made me back? I had to learn how to do so. Is that it was my see, example. Is that what you see is in the No, <laughs> I'm a lurker. But um, <laughs> I was using that example because it was really difficult, right? But my, my, don't yell my name. Um, my desire to learn something new was really big. And my 17 year old was like, mom. And then, you know, it was. <laughs> It was really, and I, I was still like, oh, I don't think this is right, right? But because I'm a lifelong learner, there's also reading that I'm doing, there's all these other things, and it should not be difficult. But the problem is not that we're learning something new, the problem is we're unlearning right. what we already knew. And so that becomes a little more later that I, it wasn't like I learned TikTok and then I unlearned TikTok to learn a better TikTok. So that was a little easier. In this particular case, I need to unlearn all the stuff that I knew that was true or that I have grown up around and now learn a new one. I also think part of the problem as educators is the infrastructures that we are responsible for. Learning is fine for the endpoint. And, and really, that's the entire purpose one student at a time so that they leave the room. And we're no longer responsible for that learning process, right? Versus this kind of conversation, where it's like, this is actually not about somebody structuring your learning for you. It's not about somebody else telling you how to be a human in a racist world, right? It's that counter to almost everything that we do in the school. Because what we actually preach, right? Like this, right? Well, yeah, we haven't buy that yet. <laughs> yeah, I guess for me, and yeah, you know, I bought into it a long time ago, so it's it's a matter of <laughs> And I'm always looking, you know, one of the things I'm always looking at is what are our students doing? Are they successful after they leave us? And how does that feedback and you know? So yeah, that's kind of the main part of my nature, but yeah, right. take your point that it's not everywhere. <laughs> well, it's not our structures. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah that's an individual. Yeah. This is not our structure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. right, you're right. So, what's your role? And this is here, Dave, when you realize, are we talking about we? Now I'm talking about as a board. What's your role in really leading? Right, because there's a notion of supporting, but leading this work as the board. What what might that look like? So I'm asking to get into different groups, and uh, I was going to have you do a free write, but given time, I just you know continue writing, and then <laughs> <laughs> take your notes with you. 
uh, given the slightly different group, and let's have, oh, uh, well, so maybe like seven minutes. Gosh, that's not a lot of time. But um, let's do some different things. It is. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, just I think yeah, just make sure you say that. Yeah, just get in a wherever you want to be. That's the question. Did you say how much? So, what is our right. Oh,
So we get all these reports that kind of kind of dissecting where is the where is the basis implication of kind of those in discussion. well, I'm not, I'm not, you know, then we get to the intent versus impact. So, was there an intent to do it? I hope not, because that would be a violation of our But what I really want to get in on that is the impact. Regardless of the impact of the same type of students, you are actually going to not get this learning experience. That part and it impacted in areas where I you know, lose more time. I accept it. Yeah, you have the time. Well, but then, you know, the thing about the first time you put this space, you have nothing wrong with it. You do say what you want to do to fix it, and then you monitor it. <laughs> and so to me, I mean, said, okay, we're going to do this. Now we're going to put a whole bunch of staff down there. We're going to go out in the state. It's fine. Let's, now, let's see that you actually did it, and then it actually produced the results. So, you know, that's the next step. And you may not have been the place that put in the whole bunch of staff. You know what? If they work together with the whole bunch of staff. We know it's going to be a We're just going to work together. We're 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 going to Done with the university to get that yeah. right, and and then where are those disparities with other schools? Which is what I appreciate about these. What is the What what were we doing that made those peaks? And that was interesting. More of just like we'll be the same. Like we'll be that you know that as we come out of the first half, sure. That piece of the for this information, but like how will we actually give it to you? Not as a taking but saying again, that was a big thing in the school. Oh, my, we're going to bring them back together. together. I know that there was a lapse in each of the steps. We're going to be like, oh, that's don't we do all students to this kind of target to be Sure. So much. So what came up for you in this early, just very, very beginning stage of the work? An overwhelming question. Mom, yeah, I think it's, it's making clear the actions that we take tie to this. Uh -huh. um, one of the things I shared. Um, it's brought up just a bit of new work to the board, and we've got a year in now. So there are so many ways which I've already figured out what is the goal of the board mm -hmm. as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and then so figuring out like how to sometimes I even just feel an ace about being a part, even by simply being a part of this system mm -hmm. or the structure that is so 
problematic mm. on a perpetual opinion, right? Mm. And so how do I figure out my role in this work, which is really that disruptive work? Well, also like in these, there's a lot of really particular rules about how we navigate things as a board member. And so in learning that, or not learning, I don't know. So it's like it's like balancing how I'm, I'm I'm still learning that, but I want to do this, and I think that's come out in ways that I think have blurred the lines a little bit of what the role is, right? And so I'm trying to be really mindful of that. So, so yeah, so it's just even being a part of the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you buy into the system, mm -hmm. then that, that's been part of us. Mm -hmm. And when you just say you don't play that part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our hope is that, and thank you for sharing that because I, I appreciate the vulnerability in that. Our hope is that these are the conversations that you'll be having as you continue to meet, right? And so I believe we sent, you all have the deck because we sent it to you with every day or Wednesday or something. Yeah, I sent that for the Thursday. I'll send it to you. I don't okay. Get it okay, so you will have it. Yeah. And then I think we may have to change it. So maybe you'll see more updated. But anyway, the questions will be in your mind. Hopefully, you can keep coming back to those as guiding posts. And so um, here are a couple of recommendations as we see the work. As you know, we're working with the district leadership team and we're working with you. And we What's easier for you is we come up with um, the five C's. You know, we really like letters. So we have the DD as our framework, and these are C's. I like alliteration, you know, more content, right? But for recommendations, things that you can think about. When I heard someone go, so what does that look like? Well, it looks like making a commitment, right? To really shifting your policies, which means you need to look at your policies, do a thorough read, and which of them, which of all of them probably, but whatever ones are anti-racist, making a commitment to look at them and figure out how to shift those, right? Um, to those policies, practices, and behaviors, communicate this vision. It may not be exactly the vision that we recommended, but communicating an anti-racist vision to your stakeholders, um, to your district, to your parents, to your community, super, super important. This is the work we're doing. We are developing an anti-racist district. Really simple, right? Um, creating some long-term realistic goals because you know, try not to create a goal. We will eradicate racism. <laughs> that my little uh, We had a client. And he's surprised how people ask. Oh my gosh! When he put, his, <laughs> he put it in our contract, he was like, "When you're through, racism will be over." I was like, "We can't exactly sign this." <laughs> <laughs> we're good. Well, we're good. Well, we're good. Well, we're good. Well, we're good. Um, I suggest that you cultivate anti-racist partnerships. There are probably folks who are doing this work locally in your region. Invite them to be partners to help support the work that you're doing. And then we just said marginalized stuff, well, what did we like? So curate listening space for, yeah. for marginalized students, community members, folks. You want to hear the voices. Remember, keep listening to the voices of people of the global majority, those who are marginalized. So um, here's some next steps. These are the three books that we are working with the district leadership team, and we would love for you to read one or all of them. Um, so first, um, Street Data, favorite, favorite, one of my favorite books. Love Shane Sophia. She's out of the new, um, she's out of the equity, national equity project. Yep. And you get, yeah, in Oakland. And so did a lot of work with her and Jamila Dugan. This talks about listening to students and communities at the margins. You're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Love it, love it, love it. So um, this is a great book. And also gives us some ideas how to create listening spaces. Mm -hmm. We really I, just, I just did a book study with a bunch of people from the area. I love it. So we're all with it. Okay. So that's one of the pieces. The Four Pivots is one of my um, new favorite books by Sean J. Wright, again from the Bay. Um, and he talks about the four things we need to do as leaders. He doesn't explicitly name anti racism. In fact, he says that we shouldn't name it as anti, but you know, we can grapple with that. But the pivots that he talks about are amazing. And he talks a lot about narrow, right? 
by doing the word here first, and as opposed to looking out the window, which is looking at how everybody else needs to change, right? Those people over there, as opposed to um, us changing. And one of the most interesting questions comes in chapter four, uh, where Benjamin McBride says, the wrong question is what do we need to do? The right question is who do we need to become? Mm -hmm. So love that, love that. And then, you know, we're gonna definitely talk about our own book. I mean, it's really necessary. Kind of like this book myself. Uh, so Chris and I uh, work with a, a, a lot of black principals, and when you hear their stories, right across several districts, some themes emerge. Um, this is a great opportunity to really hear what principals would say if they could say what they need to say about anybody else hearing them say what they need to say, right? So as you get to have this bird's eye view to what principals are experiencing across numerous districts, right? And then we offer a framework for leadership. So we tried to choose books that everyone could be reading the same, but so these are the same three that our principals and our district leadership will be reading. So we're creating this synergy from the board to the, to the district leaders and to the site leaders. Um, and a heavy emphasis on leadership, right? So um, I think you said you're going to get the books together. I'm going to be purchasing books for everybody. I wish you sort You want to have We're going to, uh, you know, we'll start with probably 50 because that's not for all. Please don't take it to the minutes for We'll start with that. Mm -hmm. I want to appreciate the vision that um, Dr. Kernan and um, Dr. Borshek had when they talked to us about this in conjunction with, I noticed that um, Dr. Anthony Brown came in. He was the, the person from PSESD that we were talking about earlier and everybody was like, what? So um, the vision that the three of them had about the alignment from boardroom to classroom and what ways are we gonna not just do this work you know, because work usually starts with um, a couple of people, teachers going, we need to do this. But now looking at alignment, I really, really appreciate that. I want to acknowledge the work that you're holding, the work that you're holding, Dr. Borchek, the work that you're holding, Dr. Brown. So important. This is, I know we keep talking about tech little small and nimble, but it can, this probably doesn't happen in some of our, it doesn't happen in our larger urban school district. We have an opportunity. Right to really get it right, and I'm I'm loving that. So we would love you to read a book, chapter, article, or other published work about anti-racism. We would love for you to share a learning with someone who's not in this room, like that you're just kind of going and go. I'm a preacher. I'm sharing. <laughs> and then our next session is in March. So we thank you so much. I would love for you to just end with this quote. Someone wants to read this quote. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti racist. There is no in between safe space of not racist, the claim of not racist neutrality is in mass for racism. As even can be, let us go forth and let us do the work. Thank you for your time today. I know you're going to take a break before turning it over to Amy. Probably, yeah, we can take a, yeah. About five, five minutes. Well, let's do it. Yeah. Okay, I heard ten minutes over here. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then went back to maybe five. Yeah. But I heard the desire for ten. <laughs> okay. Let's say eleven fifteen. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're back on um, we're back on the Okay. Now we're gonna transition to some OPA okay. maybe. <laughs> well, and let me let me just just wrap up the last section a little bit if if we can, just to um plant a couple of things in, in your brain. So um 
first of all, I, you know, I want to acknowledge the challenge of the work, but you all realize it's really amazing that we're doing it, right? Like, um, this is a this is a busy time in leading public education, and here you are looking to be um, for Uber disruptors. So I just wanted to acknowledge that part of me because I know you all really well, and it, I happen to really like you, and I want to <laughs> make sure that you you get that. I mean, it is um, if, if we want to take. You know, what you said, Dave, about being lifetime learners can be a really asset-based way of looking at work like this, instead of thinking about, um, you know, how challenging it can be to, to do um, such disruptive work. What a opportunity. I mean, if not us, then who? And here we are at this pivot point in the history of public education, disrupting and making a difference. So, oh, I didn't say anything. Let's just come out. Well, yeah, because we have an example of I made a mistake and it blew up. So, where is the safe, brave space? So, so I, I the, the thought, thought about safety can be challenging because that that can be elusive. It can be defined differently by different people. Um, but in terms of approaching anti-racism and public education. Um, you're here talking about it. You're analyzing your work in terms of approaching it. And um, there's there's a there's some tenets from cultural competency work that I want to, this is where I was going to pivot to, and I think this will help you with it. You know, the first step I think, especially as, as a, a table of white people, I've said on the whole way forward as well, um, is awareness. So, and this is what I was going to give you for the homework besides your reading. But as you look at your agendas, as you're conducting your work, I think it's a really valuable exercise to just look at what is, you know, what is very white centered about our work. And it's not to the point where you don't have to think of the solution yet. But I think awareness can be a really powerful tool. You know, for example, we just had a quick conversation around your strategic planning process. and. And you know, realizing y'all have the awareness that, oh, we're not getting the feedback from all our communities within Tuck Willow. We need to go back and try again better. That was a huge piece of awareness, right? Decentering, I'm thinking some traditionally very well represented voices, usually, because that's usually how these things go. I don't know all the details, but that's my guess. But there was awareness that that wasn't good enough this time and going back. I mean, that. That talk about the world. Okay. So oh, and you know, and it's it's challenging because I've heard there's some people who've identified this, and I don't know if anyone's gonna come up with assumptions. I am not a parliamentarian, but if Robert's rules of orders is not the most white-centric approach to a meeting that I've ever seen in my life, right? And this is what we have for our board meeting. And again, I'm not a parliamentarian, I can't invent the solution, but being aware that it's we know it's intimidating to marginalized communities to come to board meetings because of that structure. And that's a legal obligation that we're required to do that by law. There is, is I don't want to answer that. I think there's a requirement for parliamentary practice, and most people have adopted in the policy law. And so that's why it's a tricky one to get out of, is that there's, there's, and you know, and the, the point of Robert's rule was to try to make sure you have first and seconds to make sure everyone's voice can get in as you're processing decisions. But if you're not from a culture that understands that very structure, you're not going to, I mean, and even talking to suburban white families, they don't understand that structure. So, um, you know, but being aware of it, you can think about ways of, you know, inviting communities, you know, coming off the theoretical bias and you know having conversations with people and but it's that awareness you know your budget process you know thinking about how the budget process goes the curriculum innovation you know and, and what a great example about your equity policy Dave in terms of having students take a look at it and they're like oh my gosh but again you know from an asset based framing the Tech Willow Board took that input and pivoted and addressed it. 
right? And so, um, you know, what about, you know, just again, just community engagement in general, having awareness about, okay, let's, you know, think about this um, from a, a, you know, what about our practices might be very centered in like this? English one. An English one, right? Working on the pause. So, and that's why just awareness for the next couple of months, maybe between now and March, as you're reading the books and you're going through your agendas and your work, maybe, you know, what aspects of your work. And this way, too, um, we might be able to think about some things that might require just simple pivots, like going back out to the engagement on the strategic plan again. Like, there might be some simple aspects. Um, but well, we're doing some, I mean, um, Carly's. I got a task force and harassment intimidation board mm -hmm. and did a very good job involving students and all that. So, so that was just a pivot to our OPMA. <clears throat> so, oh, so is that the framing for the yes. OPMA question? All right. So, I have and um, I emailed a copy of this to Dr. Herndon. So, a summary of the, to my understanding, is a question around the changes of the OPMA. Is that, is so that where the question is about? Just kind of the front. That's a part of it. I think just some, uh, has an open dialogue about, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of concern about if we all end up in the same space and some, you know, depending on what's happening more like that, there's a new parent advisory committee, right? Okay. And so who can be in that space? How many can be in that space? Does it matter how many are in that space? So I think just even talking about some of the, those very specific Things that projects that we're working on or committees that are happening, and then within the context of each of those committees, how does OPMA relate to that? Okay, okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, so, in general, the whole theory behind OPMA is that as elected officials, um, you know, the public should have um, the equal opportunity to first hear deliberations as well as weigh into deliberations on things that are. Public. So now, and I have to say that's separate from a governance question around advisory committees that we'll go into in a sec, but I just wanna, we'll start with OPM. So if what the, and this is what's tricky, you have the OPMA law and then how courts have interpreted it as cases that come up. The courts have interpreted it really tightly. And, um, and you know, there, there are instances, for example, there is a case law and where in the state of Washington, there were newly elected board members who were not sworn in yet, but they had been elected. Um, and they were engaging in email conversation, two new members with one existing member. And they were engaging in email conversation, even though they weren't sworn in, the court interpreted it as a violation of the overcommit. Okay. I didn't even Someone else found out, and then the court found out, and it was determined to be a violation. So, you know, in terms of what is considered board business, the court has interpreted jokes about the color of pictures in a building as board business by a quorum of the board. So, I mean, and so this is unfortunately the 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 thing that we have to deal with with OK. So, so maybe just some play really good. My observation about where we get into that <laughs> into some friction was so we had a we had a process set up, you know, for I mean the issue is the three of us show up at a meeting, you know, yeah. and, and it hasn't been hasn't been noticed yeah. that's the problem. So the the goal was not to prevent us from showing up at the meeting, but just to divide the process so that we it could be noticed and then we would not be a problem. And so but we had a couple, of, I think, a couple of situations where, you know, so we had a spreadsheet, you know, mm -hmm. that we were going to check in the people, and then if the three, you know, wanted to attend the meeting, fine, you just notice it, but you need 24 hours notice, 24 hours to do that. So somebody, I think we had a situation where somebody decided, you know, inside of 24, they wanted to show up and then they showed up. And so okay. to me, it was just, it's just a matter of can we agree to, I mean, it requires a little forward thinking on all of our parts to say, okay, if, if we want to show up at a meeting, just make sure that, you know, we kind of decide that 24 hours before so that if three of us do, then, then that we can notice it and then it's fine. 
So that I, and so I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was kind of the crux of this whole thing. That was that was where we got snagged. Yeah. We weren't paying. And then somebody got really yeah. upset about it. Yeah. So <laughs> and can I ask? So is this a, an ongoing meeting that reoccurs? So it could be, or it could, but just generalize. It could yeah. be any meeting. That, yeah. You know, any right. three of us may want to go. Right. There. So we were just putting down if we go into, you know, a workshop or yeah. whatever. Or, oh. Uh, like community events, yeah, yeah. right, yeah, you know, community events, even community events. So, if, if we're standing and if we go to a park, right, and we can stand in three different places, then you know what, like, you're not thinking because that's the thing, it's not just the forum being there, it's conducting this, yeah, we're so we're not talking, talking, you're not talking to so, so, if we all end up on a Zoom meeting that has to be the ditch person at the meeting, right? But we're not even, yeah, like most of the time, I just go and listen, right? In those right. cases, that's not a violation of what we made because we're not in conducting any sort of conversation. Yeah. Right. Right. That's right. Right. Okay. That's why I mean, I'm not okay. aware, but that is my understanding of how boards of people. So, I think this question centers around our camera device. Well, that's where we ended up. I think that's that's a component of it. And then another one was uh, Jan asked about the, uh, the safety of the Fuji task force. Um, you know, basically, like if, the, if there was anybody else that wanted to be on it, then she was kind of rotating now. I don't know if they're just doing it. So, so, like, yeah, it's. it's so that one goes the, the issue of, um, yeah, three of us are there, but what we're just listening. That one, I kind of. Going back, I hear back and forth about that. Is that a violation? Well, I think because it's, I've heard it's it. Not it's a if, events, if, it's if, the, if the board is collecting information, which we're doing, if we're sitting there listening, right? Somehow that, well, that I've never been clear on that. If it's not, and that's why, not, yeah, um, but if it's not a school district event, if you're at the park or, yeah. you know, at, yeah. uh, you know, it's a, uh, Summer festivals yeah. there, you know, yeah. when you're all are there in separate corners, it's not about school business to begin with. Okay. Then that's a much better okay. case. Okay, yeah. so then what about our Yeah. So uh, virtual. So something I would also, well, if you want, I mean, honestly, to be doubly sure, I would check with the lawyer about it because it is it is an event. But I'd also give you something to think about just from a governance perspective. I mean, a board member being there to listen and have input is great, uh, it, but also just as we know, it can be very vulnerable spaces for people, and we have to be cognizant of our authority and our rules in in the district as people of authority. Some sometimes it's been documented by many people that if a board member is in the room, they're not as likely to share. And we have checked that out and we are okay. continually okay. invited. So yeah. that's, I would say, we actually did the office. That is either the opposite, most frequently in our district. They yeah. want leadership there, yeah. they want district okay. representation okay. at everything yeah. possible. Um, so, so what I'm I would suggest too is because the thing is, if the three of you go, then it's a published meeting that anyone in the community. Has the right to be there also. So that's the, the other aspect. It was yeah. courtesy. So if somebody else has organized the meeting, yeah. and then right. three of us decide on show, then then it becomes this everybody okay. can come. So you have to is the organizer of the meeting okay with that right. or not? You have to. You should check that. It's a courtesy issue. That's a courtesy issue. <laughs> so so if we're not publicly noticing it. We're just showing up on a virtual meeting. See, but if it's a school district, may I be really? I would not. You're saying not even virtual if we're not in. We I think that we're all interested in going to the parent advisory. Yeah, meeting because we want to hear what's going on. Could you take turns and pairs? I just think we know so much. But I mean, you could. I mean, I, I that's just that's a solution I've seen some boards do. But even oh, if two of us went and two of us went virtually, it would you're all still there. It's to me, it doesn't matter if it's virtual or virtual. Oh, it's still my there. understanding. Okay. Yeah, that one I think we could have noticed. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if you notice it, no, people don't, it's not this big for people to come. Just feels like a perpetuation of just these, yeah, sorry, but just really stupid law, law and systems that, like, because, yeah. like, the reality is, like, oh, like, okay, we should define the market where people can come and be with us. But the reality is, like, people, mm -hmm. it's hard for people to come to our board meetings for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like, 
sorry, uh, these are no. just like the frustrating barriers that just like make it impossible to do the anti-racist work. Well, that's where so, really, that is how, this is like how we lead. It's like we say, do we have, you know, if we're not going to pursue, what would the liability be, right? And at the end of the day, how much is it going to matter to us? Like, if, the how much are we going to yeah, pay in fines? If, yeah, if we're not conducting this, but we're just there because we want to be present, we all live in. I, okay, right, I'm so going to yeah. put it out there mm -hmm. that everyone who serves on school boards made an oath to follow the laws of the state, and it can put you in danger of recall. I'll let you know. I think it's a, okay, it's a $500, $500 <laughs> person. Um, oh, Bridget said it was $100. Huh? Bridget said it was $100. I think, it, I think they increased it. She actually got me. Oh, it's not even a district, though? It's a person with that? Uh, I know that's right. why it's in the same. I hear you, and it's like, it's like, and that was my, my crux of like, I'm in this position, yet part of like why I did this is like because of the fact that I think it's like a little bit of 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 a so many of the harmful laws that exist need to be pushed back upon, right? And change and all those things. So I realize it's been yeah, that one. I mean, the up in May will be up against all the newspapers in the state because mm -hmm. they, I mean, they're the ones that are big pushers of that because they want to be able to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, and I get that. Yeah. So, so we got two options or three options. We can break the law, we can go to that spreadsheet. And commit to using it, and or we could assign committees or rotate rotations. But, but so. I think then we lose the just of the flow of the meeting. You know, if I didn't know what was going on the last time, because I didn't attend, and I stepped in, would I know the climate and the you know. right? I'd rather fully assign who's assign like have us choose the committees that we're interested in attending more ongoing. Because I, I agree with you, I think the will probably be hard for me to go in and out of space and not have the other option would be to announce it as a meeting, but we need to go through my channels to do that. Right. Does the same thing happen in sports events? District sponsored event. District sponsored event. Yeah. I have to, if, sorry, I yeah, I'm just going to see the three of us. Can. Be uh, if ball you ball. want to, uh, so we can have a football team is what I'm going to get signed. So I'm signing up. I'll pay the hundred. It's I know it's a good thing sense. <laughs> I'm just saying that a, a lot of a lot of districts I've known that a majority of the board is going to a, a square if I didn't publish it. But again, there's no risk that you're not, you know, doing something like a racial and educational justice committee where you know, you know, the committee itself, I mean, I'm not saying yeah. this is your situation. Sometimes those committees don't want it to be right. 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 And this is like, for example, this is um boards run into this and talking to city councils or legislators, like sometimes you need to have productive conversations in a, not a public meeting. And then a majority of the board can go. Like there's other venues for this definitely comes to play. But um, I mean, honestly, if, if you publish a football game as a public meeting, it's- Sounds like, sounds like we probably need to do a quick check-in with the attorney. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't think that, I've never had the impression that so it says so clearly when action is being. Like, yeah. I've heard some complaints when board members have been in the same church. Oh, well, that's the complaints that are brought in the case of the that's the, it's the how the law is interpreted. That's so yeah. that's the other aspect of it is do you have somebody? I mean, over the years. At one point, we did have somebody in the community who was kind of eyeing mm -hmm. us on that. Mm -hmm. We don't now, to my knowledge. And so, you know, there's that dynamic that's going right. on as well. So, Thanks. what are what are we going to do? <laughs> what are the kind of suggestions as we want to just wait? We're going to come up with a proposal to the lawyer. Personally, the spreadsheet thing worked for me, but. For me, it's like when I was attending the recent equity meeting, to go weekly and see the flow right. was really important and to hear the voices and feel the temperature. And I missed the very meeting because I was telling, oh, I haven't even been there to the parent meeting because mm -hmm. we need to be hearing what these parents mm -hmm. concerned about. So, 
Can we touch this one? So right. you just want to break the law, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I was reporting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think if I've said worse things. If, if, if there's a way to uh, that you want to approach it, we can definitely have a legal review to say how can we approach this in a way that allows as many learning groups to as possible. Has any district ever come up with a policy that says all all students who are open to public view? Uh, no. Because <laughs> not how long? No. Yeah. You have to be specific for it. You do. Now we're trying to be because in any given day there's about hundred events that are going. Yeah, yeah, that would drive them. Yes. And the rest of the staff probably. Carrie could do. Yeah. Have you noticed but, your absence? What's that? Debbie's absence. Have you noticed it? I have. Yeah. Oh. And she helps organize like so yeah. She does. Yeah, she does. Yeah, she, she should be back on. She's Monday. Yeah, it seems like a potential uh, hybrid. I mean, if we have certain committees that certain people want to go to, yeah. sign up and say, but that, that 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 was part of the purpose of the spreadsheet that was set up for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, race family and the Valen movement, check check that, you know, so. Okay. So we could ask Deb to update that spreadsheet. Well, that, was, so that spreadsheet, the way it was originally was, we were responsible for doing it. So if, if I wanted to go to, no, I know that. Yeah, but Bridget's name is still on there. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, 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 yeah right, right. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we could add it as a tab to the board tracking sheet we already have, so we don't need to make sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would, I think, request that like some. I guess like, and, and it, it's fine. If we decide not to do today, but like at least we like. So like for instance, the ta task force, I don't think it would be beneficial to have a rotating, rotating board members that are in there. So I think either we have two and those are the two or there's one and the other one rotates in, but I, I prefer it to be, I think that consistency is valuable for the committee's work, the task force work, and also for the board um, representatives. So I guess I'm asking if neither of y'all, if both of y'all are okay with it, are y'all okay if Jan and I are the representatives on that task force? Okay. And then I really appreciate the update about it. Yeah. Well, that was race and Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's race and equity, there's the task force, there's the technology, there's the MLL, the multi level thing, parent advisory. Parent advisory. And you got the MLL. I, I have it. Yeah. And so she asked me to be on it also. So there's two on that one. Well, we don't know where that's going. That's true. We don't. But, uh, yeah, but it's still in there. So I don't know if there are other things that I guess the other part of the the responsibility. So if one of if we agree to go to them, then it's the responsibility of the people who go to report back to the rest of us in, in meeting them what happened. Is there part of this? And how do how do we report that? during our um, or can we do or can email like an email? We could grab a little template thing that you just well, it's probably emails. <laughs> well, you can ask the document in our or, yeah. or Debbie to send them out. So yeah. you could, you know, you could forward the report to okay. someone in the administrative office and then they send it. Okay, the, the main thing yes. is just not ongoing. Yeah. So reporting yeah. out is fine, but it's the like oh. daily That's checking of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, like that report you did on the president. Yeah, it's hard to have that conversation about decentering and and dis disrupting and you know, all back into this. Yeah, and be like, well, we can't even go to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Literally, exactly. With, you know, that law exists. I mean, I know there's a lot of benefits to it as well, but it also exists. Yeah, to me, it just requires figuring out a structure to, mm -hmm. to not violate it and still get the benefit of going to it, which I think can be done. It requires a little work. But. So I can also just have a clarity of the legal side about which types, what are the locations that pose that challenge? Which ones are the okay? That would probably be helpful. Yeah, and I'm sure they. Got uh, you know, a legal reason to ask that. 
there's new board members come in all the time to follow the same message like that. Here's a I boarded uh, the attachment that Amy said earlier. So I just called oh, the update. You know, yeah. I think the challenge in this first thing that you said is like the law saying one thing because I've never read it. Like, and I, and I, so what I exactly is that? I read all those right. things and feel like I understand them really well, but then when precedent is set based on legal by a court case, then that changes yeah. how yeah. that law is read and interpreted. Yeah. And it just, yeah. Case and the challenge is it's like some kind of single single instances that change that a lot like three board members sitting in a football meeting talking about how they want to get rid of another board member and then all of a sudden that becomes an open and the one that makes sense. Well, and the thing is, too, I think the nature of the work is so all encompassing. It's so easy to be talking about boring business before yeah. you know it. Like just standing at the football game and noticing that the turf is getting worn. Right? right. Like, I mean, just, and just thinking thoughts out loud thought out that's been interpreted as. Well, there's a whole question. I mean, for years, you know, like the log in meeting, mm -hmm. I mean, I understand some boards notice that, but of course, you can't go. I mean, people can't go because they don't have a you know, register. I actually saw some residents of Mercer Island at an animal conference. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like some people go. Only once did I ever see that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the logistics behind it. Yeah. When I was in Tacoma, there was the, they were doing some board work uh, in Boston mm. for family engagement and they traveled. They noticed it, and someone from the community went to Boston also. To go out there at the same time. They had a couple of people who tracked everything once in. So they actually go out there and went to the same thing that we did, like on their own time. That's like, wow, there's <laughs> a lot of commitment. Mm -hmm. But I've had, um, since there was a legal. Um, Abigail? Yeah, Abigail, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Her saying one time that, you know, if you go to something that's lost a business, it doesn't violate the agreement. And she's a lawyer, she would know yeah. more than me. So, like going to the laws, uh, regional yeah, specifically with more business. Yeah. That one seems odd. Uh, that feels like yeah. that that was, that was, to the law. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's why I, this, this whole area you know, was in I weird mean, ways. I've never totally figured out. We'll get it up, but I'll get it Absolutely. Okay. Only tell us if it's what we want to hear. It's good that you're clear about that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, but that's all I have to chat about. I mean, any other questions or anything we can talk about while we're still here? Or... Yeah. I all have a lot of reading for you. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I have not. I want to. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I found it very interesting. Didn't take the photos off. The data that you actually look at. the nuanced, any personal, cultural reality. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not as easy to look at because it's not far to me, it puts the, the things in the right place. And satellite data, it's interesting when you read that book, they always, a lot of the examples they said. So we noticed in the satellite data that there was a problem. It doesn't tell us anything how to solve it, but then it told us where to focus. And then they focus down and the street data, which is to me, it has always been the, the proper use of that data should be. That is interesting. But it just, yeah. going back to No Child Left Behind, it was not used that way. And it's been horribly abused ever since. It's supposed to be more about, oh, okay, this this is an area you should dig deeper. Well, no child left behind it was used to punish mm -hmm. schools. They said, well, you have the slow score, therefore you're you're bad, mm -hmm. you know, which is not. Real. Well, it's it's like using the I ready as a satellite rather than looking at each kid saying, oh, this kid missed the stuff on fractions. Let's go back and get this kid caught up on fractions, rather than saying all fourth graders. Need to get caught up on fractions, you know, all over. Yeah, whatever. <laughs>